Good evening. The Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District Board of Trustees are now convening a board work session on Thursday, November 4th, 2021 at 6 p.m. in the boardroom of the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District Instructional Support Center located at 10,300 Jones Road, Houston, Texas, for the purpose of reviewing that portion of the Monday, November 8th, 2021 regular board meeting agenda designated as action items and to hear designated reports and recognitions posted in the meeting notices required by Texas law. I want to welcome the members of our audience and our television viewers to this meeting of the Board of Trustees. As the Cypress Fairbanks Board of Trustees, we are here to set goals, listen to reports, approve budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. It is not the role of the board to make day-to-day -day operational decisions. The management and day-to-day -day operations of the district are the responsibility of the superintendent. We have policies and procedures in place to resolve concerns and issues. This is a public meeting of the Board of Trustees, not a meeting of the public. Prior to this meeting, board members received information related to items on tonight's agenda. <coughs> agenda items will not necessarily be handled in the order listed on the notice. The meeting is open to all who wish to attend and hear the matters discussed. During the course of this meeting, the board may determine that a closed session is necessary. In that event, the board will meet in closed session to consider matters duly posted for this meeting as permitted by sections 551.071 through 551.084 of the Texas Government Code. These proceedings are in live on Comcast Channel 16 and the district website. They will also be available as video on demand on the district website following tonight's meeting. For the video to adequately reflect the proceedings, I respectfully ask that you please refrain from talking while others are speaking and that cell phones are turned off or in silent mode. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening and for your interest in the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize our community leadership committee members who are in attendance this evening. I think tonight we have Tana Lamb. Hello, Tana, thank you for being here, and Ryan Irving. Ryan, thank you for being here. The Invocation, Pledge of Allegiance, Vision and Mission Statement, Recognitions, Board Comments, Citizen Participation and Reports, portion of the agenda will be presented at the regular board meeting on Monday, November 8th, 2021. At this time, we will proceed with the public comments portion of the agenda, agenda item 4A. Patrons who have duly registered per policy BED local may address the board and make public comments on an agenda item during or before the board's consideration of the item. The board may allow public comment on agenda items at all meetings. The board will continue with the remaining agenda after the registered patrons have had an opportunity to speak. To participate, registration is between 5.30 and 5.50 on the day of the board meeting at the entrance to the CFISD boardroom. <coughs> Tonight we have one speaker and it happens to be Ms. Tana Lamb. Pick 3A, which was honors and achievements, which is our bands going to the state contest on Monday. Yay! <laughs> Jersey Village, Cy Woods, and Bridgeland, which is our high school. So yay. And then I picked 2B for just wanted to say thank y'all so much for our lead plan, um, learn, empower, achieve, dream for all children. Um, the, I know y'all are instrumental in putting this together. I've always felt for like my kids have been safe at school that y'all have you know taking care of all of our kids and also being that I have an LGBTQ child he has never felt unsafe at school everybody was very accepting y'all have always put to forth accept everyone so I thank you and y'all will be missed thank you Tana <clears throat> before we proceed with the public hearing portion of the agenda I would like to let the viewing audience know that each month during the board work session the administration provides oral reports on various departments in addition to the reports outlined in the district's board monitoring system. The board monitoring system, a mechanism to measure the district's progress in achieving goals, may be viewed on our website under our district about CFISD, know your district, district improvement plan goals. And now we will proceed with the public hearing agenda item 7A. The board will hold a public hearing at 6.05 p.m. on Thursday, November 4th, 2021 on the 2019-2020 district school first accountability rating 
And our presenter is Ms. Karen Smith. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Um, I, I actually, uh, I'm gonna have Amanda Bowles do the presentation, our Assistant Superintendent of Business and Financial Services. And as she's coming up, I just wanna remind you that the district has to have a public hearing within 60 days of receiving their final rating. So we will be going over the results of the, the rating as well as our annual financial management report, that, or annual management report that you should have a copy of. Amanda? All right. Good evening, Dr. Henry, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to present the district's results for the school's first rating for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Um, FIRST stands for Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, and as Karen said, we're required to hold the public hearing within 60 days of receiving the final FIRST rating. Schools FIRST was enacted by the Texas Legislature in 1999 as a method to hold school districts accountable for the quality of their financial management practices. It also ensures that districts are providing maximum allocation for instruction and evaluates the quality of financial management decisions. CFISD has, has earned the state's highest fiscal accountability rating for 19 years and since the inception of the system in fiscal year 2001-2002. Listed here are four, accountability, four financial accountability ratings that can be assigned to uh, school districts. And as I mentioned, CFISD received the highest rating of superior. The school's first objectives, the rating system is intended to be simple and understandable applicable to all districts based on actual data that is reported to TEA, such as PEMS and, annual, and the annual, annual financial report. Schools First also analyzes financial management efficiencies, can bring to light early warning signs of financial distress, and provides transparency to all stakeholders. The Schools First rating system is based on 20 indicators. One of those indicators is not currently being scored, which is indicator number five, and this is due to the accounting changes for pensions. Of the 19 indicators that are scored, CFISD received the maximum number of points on 17 of those indicators. In addition to the indicators, we are also required to disclose the five items listed on the slide. The superintendent's contract for the current 2021-2022 fiscal year has to either be disclosed in our first report or separately on the district's website, and we choose to include that in the first report. We are also required to report any reimbursements to the superintendent and to the board for items such as travel for professional development. The reimbursement amounts reported are included in figure A2 on page 23 of the annual financial management report that each of you were provided this evening. And this report will also be added to the financial information section on our website. In addition, we are required to report on any outside compensation received by the superintendent in exchange for professional consulting, gifts of 250 or more to executive officers, the board, and their immediate families, and also any business transactions between the district and the board. There was nothing to report for the three items listed, for the last three items listed, sorry. At this time, I would like to describe the three categories of indicators that the district is scored on. The first category is the critical indicators, and failure of any of these indicators would be an automatic failure of schools first. The critical indicators include submitting the annual financial report to TEA by the deadline of November 27th for June 30 year ends. Another critical indicator is to receive an unmodified opinion on the annual financial audit report, which is the highest level of assurance that we can be given for the, on our financial statements. Also making timely payments for our bonded debt and to state and federal agencies such as TRS and IRS. And as I mentioned earlier, the last indicator here is currently not being scored due to the fact that a majority of school districts are now reporting a negative net, net asset balance due to the accounting requirements for pensions. The second category of indicators evaluates the district's solvency and are de uh, designed to detect early signs of solvency related issues. There are nine total indicators, three of which are new for this rating year. The three new indicators include an evaluation of the three year change in fund balance, a three year comparison of budgeted to actual revenues, and debt per $100 of assessed property value. And explanations of each of these solvency indicators are included in the annual financial management report. The last category of indicators is financial competency. These indicators are designed to show quality of district management decisions and financial management practices. 
There are six total indicators, three of which are new for this rating year. The three new indicators include an enrollment variance ratio, a transparency indicator that ensures the district has posted all required financial information to its website, and verification that property values were discussed at a board meeting within 120 days prior to the adoption of the budget. And as you may recall, Karen Smith discussed the property values at both the May and June board meetings prior to the adoption of the budget. There's one indicator that I would like to highlight, and that's indicator number 13, which is the administrative cost ratio. The administrative cost ratio is general administration plus instructional leadership cost divided by instruction, library media services, staff development, and counseling. And for districts with more than 10,000 students, we're allowed an administrative cost ratio up to 8.55%. And as you can see here, CFISD has been well below this threshold for many years. And for the year that is being reported, the district had a 3.67 administrative cost ratio. For further comparison, I would like to show the administrative cost ratio for a few of the area school districts and larger districts across the state. As you can see, one of the highest administrative cost ratios in our area is Spring ISD with 10.59%, and Dallas being the second largest district in the state is at 10.17%. And Houston being the largest district in the state is at 5.09%, and CFISD, the third largest district in the state is at 3.67%. And as you can see, CFISD is one of the lowest administrative cost ratios in the area and across the state. This concludes my presentation. At this time, Karen and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. That was a great job, Amanda. Uh, any questions from board members? Tom? I know everybody's surprised that I would have questions on numbers. Uh, and I don't know, <clears throat> Amanda, if you want to handle these or if Karen does. But first, if we take a look at items, uh, indicators number 15 and 19, I noticed that we only received five points, yet other indicators, we, we received more than just five points. Why is that? Yes, sir. Um, five points <clears throat> is actually the maximum that you can receive on those two. So on both 15 and 19, even though it's a low point total, it is the maximum. That's correct. Well, let's take a look at a couple of, of the others. Okay. On number 11, <coughs> ratio of long-term liabilities to total assets, uh, which is supposed to be a solvency issue. And we had a total of four points and the maximum number is 10. So the question I have for you, is one, explain this low rating, and then two, explain why we should be concerned or why we should not be concerned. Okay. Um, this one, it's very difficult for a district that's growing and has a bond program um, to receive the maximum number of points on this one. And although it's a solvency indicator, um, we're not concerned with it. Um, and the, the reasons why is the indicator is looking at our long-term debt as if we're gonna pay off that debt in one single year, when in fact we're gonna be paying it out over 20 plus years. Um, the district does have sufficient funds to meet its annual bond payments. And um, this indicator is also looking at our total debt when all of our assets that we're gonna build with that debt are not reflected on our financial statements yet. Um, and another piece of this indicator um, that most districts or some districts can get the full 10 points is if their growth is or their student enrollment is um, growing by more than 7% over the last five years. Um, and while CFISD, we've increased our students um, over the last five years by 3,464, we are below that 7% threshold. So we don't automatically get the full 10 points on this one. So what exactly is this ratio? It is looking at our long-term liabilities from our governmental, or sorry, government-wide financial statements. Um, so it's all of our long-term debt divided by our um, total assets. Mr. Jackson, if I can add to, um, Amanda mentioned that uh, our increase in students was 3,464. Well, that's enough to build a new school and possibly several elementary schools. So 
that's one of the areas where we believe it's really not realistically looking at district's debt. And the way we like to look at this, think of it like a mortgage. You do a mortgage because you don't want to pay it off all at one time. You can't pay it off all at one time. However, you qualify for that mortgage because you have, you know, your, 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 your um, financial position for yourself is good and you're paying it off gradually. And this is kind of the same thing, but it's not looking at it like that. You know, there's a, a slightly different aspect of this as well. In a, if we were a business, the assets listed would be what would help generate the revenue. However, in this case, these assets do not generate revenue. They generate, we hope, uh, student attainment for uh, our students. So what should we be looking at in terms of ability of solvency to pay off the debt? You want to take that? Oops. Actually, we should be looking at property values and, you know, what, what the state is really concerned about. Well, I, what I look at is what our rating agencies look at. And our rating agencies, they look at you know, are our property values sufficient to warrant what we're building? Number one, you know, what, is, what are we gonna have to do with our debt rate? They look at our enrollment, because if we have declining enrollment, but we're building buildings, you, they, they question that. So they look at enrollment, they also look at fund balance. So I would say looking at the property values and then also one of the things, and this will also be related to the other indicator that you probably will have questions over is it, some of the indicators act like we should be having enough funds in our debt service fund to pay off our entire um, debt. However, all we are allowed to, to um, set is our INS, our debt service tax rate, is a rate in order to pay off the next year's debt service payments. You can't do it for that whole amount. So it's almost, it doesn't make sense really how it's calculated. And, and your answer uh, does help to answer that question. So thank you for the good explanation. Uh, the last question I have is on uh, indicator number 12. And this is debt per $100 of assessed value uh, ratio. And once again, it's supposed to identify whether or not it's sufficient to support future debt. Uh, so how many points were reallocated? What was the maximum amount uh, and, and give me a little more background on this, please. Yes, sir. Um, we received eight points on this one, and the <coughs> max is 10 points. This is a new indicator this year, um, and it's intended to evaluate the district's ability to make um, our debt, principal, and interest payments. The debt figure that they're using in this calculation, again, is our long-term debt, um, which we don't feel is reasonable considering our bond-related debt is not paid in a single year, like I mentioned, and it'll be paid out over the next 20-plus years. Um, in which the property tax base will continue to grow. So they're looking at our long-term debt compare, compared to our property tax base this year, when that property tax base will continue to grow. Um, most growing school districts who have bond programs did lose points on this indicator. So at the end of the day, did we wind up with a sufficient number of points to once again to have the maximum rating? Correct, we did. Excellent. Good report, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Julie? Um, I, great report. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, very helpful. And this is great um, to, infor to reinforce and to remind um, the community that uh, CFISD continues to be good stewards of tax dollars to continue to earn the <coughs> highest rating possible. Um, I find it really interesting. I was looking at uh, indicator number six, which is one of the new indicators mm -hmm. having to do with um, fund balance. Um, it's interesting that you would lose points if you, your fund balance decreases too quickly or by too much, right. the same time during this last legislative, legislative session that there was discussions about forcing school districts to pull funds out and to lower their fund balances before the state would provide state funding um, for things like COVID, technology, student achievement. So I find that a little bit ironic. That's my comment. Any other questions from board members? One thing I do want to... <clears throat> I do want to point out because a lot of times you'll hear some people in the public that are, uh, I guess the best way to phrase it would be uninformed, uh, is 
and y'all kind of glanced over a little bit, but that administrative cost ratio and how low we are on that, because you'll hear comments in the community, well, you know, they need to just cut the fat up top, just spending way too much. When you look at that, you see the difference between us and neighboring districts and then districts statewide. I think that that's a great reflection, Karen, of you and your staff and our entire leadership team that we truly do more with less than any district around us. So uh, it's not necessarily great, you know, but, but we, we do great things with uh, a lot less money. So kudos to y'all. That's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Amanda, great job. Thank you. Now we will proceed to the with the discussion portion of the agenda. Uh, agenda item 9, 9A, the board will discuss the establishment of attendance boundaries for elementary school number 57 for the 2022-2023 school year. And I know how much Christy Geron enjoys this. And she's leaving now because she doesn't want to do it. <laughs> It'd be up here too. There it is. Evening, everyone. It's been two years since we have had a boundary proposal, and what an eventful last two years we've had. Board members, if you recall, it was this time five years ago that I stood here and proposed a new boundary line, new boundary lines for Wells Elementary. Right now, if Wells were middle school, it would be the second largest in the district. It's incredible to watch the growth in the Bridgeland area. Since we were introduced to the development of Bridgeland, the district has planned three elementary schools for Bridgeland since the beginning. I'm here tonight to share with you the boundary proposal for the third elementary school in Bridgeland, elementary number 57, yet to be named. While no boundary decisions are easy, what is nice about this proposal is it only involves students that live in Bridgeland, and they will still attend an elementary school in Bridgeland with this proposal. Tonight, I'm going to go over a detailed presentation to explain the proposed boundary changes for SciFair ISD for the 22-23 school year as a result of one new elementary school, Elementary 57. Like in the past, we provided you with a copy of our PowerPoint presentation, which includes maps and charts to help explain this proposal. If at any time you need to stop me or that you can ask or to get asked questions about to get your bearings on the map, please don't hesitate to do so. Okay. First slide, speaking of elementary 57, this is a rendering of the beautiful building. It's the only thing I've seen. Okay. The following people were on the committee, and as you can see, there were representatives from transportation, special programs, accountability department, curriculum, assistant superintendents over all three levels of administration, and the associate principal, associate superintendent, Teresa Hull. In addition to this list, we consulted with PASA for this proposal. We've included a timeline that we would like to follow. I will make a proposal tonight in order to populate elementary number 57. Starting next week, we will post this proposal on our website and share a link for the community to provide input. At the December board work session, we will review the community input and the board input and hopefully make our final boundary recommendation to the board on December 13th. Then on December 14th, pending approval, we will post the final board approved boundary changes. When looking at the possible boundary changes, the committee considers the following. Campus feeder systems, community uh, neighborhoods, enrollment projections, geographical proximity of the students to the schools, input from the community, location of thoroughfares, creeks, easements, and other structures, minimizing changes, and school capacities. Okay. Now for the details. The top of the slide shows current numbers, which include enrollment data from last Friday, our snapshot day. As you can see, Wells is busting at the seams, and both campuses have already exceeded PASA's projections, which to us is, is awesome. The purple chart is from PASA and shows the projected numbers for these two campuses for the next five years. These numbers reflect what enrollment would be at Wells and Pope if we were not building a new school. Again, since both campuses have already exceeded these projections for this year, you can realistically add 40 more kids to the enrollment of each consecutive year at Pope, and respectively, you could add 80 more kids to the enrollment of Wells. Thank goodness this is not the case. Elementary 57 will open in the fall of 2022 to relieve Wells Elementary. 
One thing I do want to note, um, in 2017 when we opened Wells, we opened on the snapshot date at 549. You can do the math, that's almost 1,100 students in four years in Bridgeland. Okay, now for the maps. This building utilization map was produced in the spring of 2021 to help with the 21-22 projections and boundaries. You can easily identify where those hotspots are, the wells Bridgeland area, and in the southwest corner, which will receive relief the following year in 23-24. This map shows the utilization in 10 years if nothing is built. Growth is clearly occurring primarily on the west side of the district. Here are our current elementary attendance zones. The red star reflects where elementary 57 is under construction. In this picture, you can also see where Pope is located. Since the enrollment at Pope is stable and at optimal utilization, it made sense to the committee that the obvious lines for elementary 57 needed to be in the Wells attendance zone only and be somewhere between those two schools. The committee, after digging, digging through the data and the different developments in Bridgeland, the committee came up with these proposed lines. The map on the left is what we currently have. The map on the right is our proposed. The yellow area represents our proposed boundary, li boundary lines for elementary 57. For a more detailed look, the bold black lines distinguish between the attendance boundary zones The bold black lines distinguish between the attendance boundary zones of elementary schools, prominently Pope and Wells, on this slide. The red outlined section within the Wells attendance boundary zone is the proposed line for elementary 57. We chose major roads and or waterways to, for, to form these boundary lines. The red line right between Wells and 57 is a line of waterway. The, the corner is actually Copper Breaks Crossing and Tuckerton. Doesn't say it really right there because that's a little street. You can see it on the next map. Again, here's a more detailed map of the developments included. We call this our res code map. Basically, we're pulling three res codes from wells to populate elementary 57. They're res codes 138, which is called Bridgeland Lakeland Bend, res code 535, which is Park Lane Cypress Apartments, and res code 238, which is Bridgeland East. There's, I can share the numbers of those if you'd like to in each one of those, to, if, you, if you need to me to. With these proposed boundary changes, here are the projected resident students for Pope, Wells, and Elementary 57. You can see how balanced they will be next year and how steady Pope's enrollment continues to be and also the enrollment of Elementary 57. The continued enrollment growth at Wells will be addressed with the opening of Elementary 59 in the future. Now, let's talk about boundary transfer rules in elementary schools. Any elementary school student affected by this boundary change who will be in the fifth grade for the 22-23 school year may remain at their current elementary school on a student transfer if their parents provide transportation. This opportunity will not be available for younger siblings. Currently, we have 107 students in Wells that would qualify to stay at Wells if they so choose to. Starting next Tuesday, we'll be informing the community of these proposed boundary changes. School messenger, phone calls and emails, district and school newsletters, district and school websites, press release to the local media, and the community input via www.cfisd.net. The form stack will look like this, the same we've used for, for all previous boundary changes. So the committee is encouraged to record their input regarding our proposal on this link. We will share this link with all board members um, every Friday and we'll review these um, requests or concerns, and we will address them at the next board meeting. And at this time, it concludes our proposed boundary changes for elementary 57.
Are there any questions? Yeah. Julie? Um, Christy, on the five-year elementary school enrollment projections uh -huh. page, why do you show Pope declining enrollment? Joel, can we put that one back up there? But in, but why is that different than the projections from the first slide? Why, why, why does it show Pope at 987, 986? Um, these are just residents. Residents only, we do have transfer students and we do have special programs and these are residents only in that lasso of those res codes. And so, and these are passes projections. Okay. Again, we've already exceeded those projections by around 40 students per year. Right. So, I mean, bottom line is there's a difference between 22 and 23 to 26, 27 on this by six students. But again, it's already off by 40-ish and growing so this is just what they gave us gotcha. and from that you know we, we don't want to change what they've given us we know that number is going to be increased okay and christy am i correct um pope currently has pre-k pre-k and k so for um pre-k yes. programs there and so not all of those pre-k students are residents in the pope attendance mm -hmm. zone so when you only count residents it reduces that makes sense that number yeah. okay thank you Tom? Christy, uh, mm -hmm. you've used an acronym <clears throat> several times tonight. The board knows what you're talking about, but I don't know that the viewing audience does. <coughs> Who or what is PASA and why do we care? Population survey analysts. They are our um, go-to for uh, demographers. They are people that help us with um, the growth and all of the information that is provided uh, they there are third source if you will to help us with our boundary changes and our yearly projections and do they update that analysis on a periodic basis every year we provide a file uh, the day after the snapshot date and they use that to come up with projections and suggestions for long-range planning for our district uh, in the spring of next year so every October November we send them a file and by February we get a new set of data that we use for the following year are we the only school district or do they represent a number of governmental uh, entities a large number of districts use PASA for their demographer thank you as a demographer thank you John mm -hmm. any other questions from board members Christy thank you for your report mm -hmm. appreciate it The board will now review the following consensus action item, agenda item 10A. The board will consider approving the minutes of the October 11, 2021 regular board meeting. Any questions? The board will now review the following non-consensus action items. Action item uh, 11A, the board will consider approving the district's 2021 comprehensive annual financial report and single audit report and accept the auditor's report on the district's general purpose financial statements and single audit for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2021. And we have a brief presentation. Might be from Karen Smith. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I missed it on Amanda, so yeah. I if I was a little iffy on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, board members, I'm proud to present to you today the um, annual comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 20th, I mean, June 30th, 2021. Uh, the Texas Educa Education Code requires an annual financial audit of the district, and the Single Audit Act requires a compliance audit of our federal funds. So you should have a copy of our comprehensive annual financial report as well as our single audit report. Uh, the district prepares the entire comprehensive annual financial report. So I would like to recognize Amanda Bowles, Mabel Isles, Melissa McAneer and Annette Pete for their, their work on this as well as their staff because they work very hard throughout the year. This may be a single report, but it actually represents a year's worth of work. The district continues to receive the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting, which is no, 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 it's a very difficult task to be able to accomplish this and complete all the work. 
uh, you may not know this, a little tidbit, but um, last year only 6% of the districts in Texas completed the comprehensive fin annual financial report. So they typically prepare what's called an annual financial report. And uh, the CAFR, or the a comprehensive annual financial report, is really nice because in the statistical section it shows 10 years worth of 10 years of data and it's more transparent by showing those 10 years you can better see the district's financial position but our bond rating agencies really like to see the comprehensive annual financial report I'd also like to recognize the communication staff for the design of the, the cover of the uh, comprehensive annual financial report. And also, in a few minutes, Greg Peterson is with us from Weaver and Tidwell, and he will go over the um, actual audit uh, that was done by them. So next is the state, as you will see here, is the statement of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance. And this reflects the district's operations during the fiscal year and what the effect was on fund balance. As of June 30th, 2021, the general fund, which this, that's the uh, main operating fund of the school district, the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance reflects total revenues of $997,328,193 and total expenditures of approximately $1 billion. There is also, you will see, a transfer of $5 million. It is an accumulation of the contributions to the self-funded workers' compensation plan that is in excess of our claims. Also, the district implemented governmental accounting standards uh, statement number 84 in 2020-21. And what this had to do with is how we record some of our fiduciary funds. And what they are for our school district, it represents our custodial activity funds. We used to call them um, agency activity funds. And these are the funds that represent our student clubs and organizations, as well as maybe some of our faculty organizations where they raise money for the benefit of, of their themselves and then the money is spent on them. And we're just acting kind of as an agent in holding that money. GASB 84 required that certain funds the district has control over be reclassed if it met, didn't meet certain criteria. And so there was, uh, there was a little bit that was either would need to be transferred possibly to our uh, campus activity fund, which is for the general welfare of the student body, or to the general fund if it did not meet that criteria. So you'll see here um, that there was a prior period adjustment because of this of about $1.1 million. And then uh, you will also see that the uh, district's change in net fund balance prior to the effect of GASB 84 was an increase in fund balance of $1.3 million. And then if you take into account the prior period adjustment, that increase is $2.4 million. Now I'll go over some of the highlights impact, impacting the general fund. You'll see here that fund balance rem uh, th that has remained stable throughout the coronavirus pandemic. The district received 38 million less in state aid this year due to the decline in enrollment and also because of our average daily attendance. Although the state indicated they were gonna hold us harmless from, for um, ADA, the state reduced state aid, uh, actually reduced state aid by that hold harmless. And then the districts could hold themselves harmless themselves by utilizing the ESSER II funding. That for C Cypress Fairbanks ISD, the amount of that hold harmless was $15 million. You may recall that I mentioned in the past that, um, that they would completely hold us harmless. And like I said, the $38 million is the total amount. And we actually drew down $16.8 million from the ESSER II funds. It was a combination of the hold harmless and then to make the district whole for the fiscal year. This is the second year that the ESSER funds have been utilized by the state to reduce funding to school districts. Then based on the uh, results as of June 30th, uh, 2021, the district had 6.2 months in fund balance. The district has really tried to strategically plan and will continue to strategically plan, looking at those ESSER funds over the period of time that we can use them throughout 2024 and balancing the budget as well as addressing learning loss. 
General administration is 1.7% of total expenditures, and it well, uh, remains well below the state average of 3.4%. The district uh, continues to have one of the lowest administrative cost ratios, and this is different than the one that Amanda shared with you, which was for 2019-2020, and it would be 3.54%. And I won't go over the how that's calculated since Amanda already shared that with you a few minutes ago. So now I will turn it over to Greg Peterson to discuss the auditor's report, and then both of us will be able to answer, be available to answer questions when he's completed his presentation. Greg. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, members of the board. It's my pleasure to uh, present the results of our audit, and I think you'll all be very pleased with these results. Um, so the point of an audit is for the auditors to render an opinion on the financial statements. Uh, we are going to render an unmodified opinion, also known as a clean opinion. So as Amanda said earlier, that that is the highest level of assurance that you can receive in an audit uh, is an unmodified opinion. We conducted our audit in accordance with uh, generally accepted auditing standards. Uh, we also use government auditing standards. And as just a quick reminder, so when we're auditing the financial statements, we don't just look at the numbers. We also have to take into consideration and obtain an understanding of internal controls to help us design uh, our audit procedures. And throughout that process, we did not identify any deficiencies in internal controls. We didn't have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses uh, that we identified uh, throughout our audit processes. Also, as part of our audit process, we do take into consideration cer certain fraud risks. <coughs> um, and our standards do require us to do certain procedures uh, to address those fraud risks that we identify. Um, that said, we did our audit procedures are not or our audit purpose is not to identify and detect fraud, but is just to be aware, cognizant of fraud. Um, and we did not identify any fraud uh, during any of the procedures that we performed as part of our audit. Next is our opinion on the uh, federal programs that we audit. Um, we perform these audits in accordance with government auditing standards and also the uniform guidance. Um, we had four major programs that we audited this year, and we are going to render an unmodified opinion on those program audits as well. Um, as part of that, we test compliance, and we also obtain an understanding of your internal controls, uh, obtain an understanding of internal controls over compliance. I really hope that's not me. <laughs> I left my phone over there. <laughs> uh, Anyway, clean opinions. <laughs> I think that's what we were talking about, clean opinions. Uh, so the four programs that we audited, we did the Child Nutrition Cluster, we audited the Title I program, we audited the ESSER funding and the Corona Relief funding. Uh, so as Karen mentioned earlier, um, uh, the ESSER funding was used to help offset some of the reduction in state funding. The, the, the Child Nutrition, ESSER, and Corona are all COVID-related programs or receive COVID funding. Uh, or partial COVID funding as part of the operations of those programs. And I think that is it. Yes. That's right. I have. Any questions for Karen or Mr. Peterson? Thank you for being here. I hope that wasn't an important call. I hope it wasn't your phone. It doesn't matter. <laughs> hey, everyone's phone goes off in here. <laughs> Not a big deal. Yes. Tom? Thank you for being here. You fulfill a most important role and function uh, for the community, but also for the school district and the board. Uh, you mentioned that you audit major programs. Do yes. you audit all the major programs in one year, or do you do this on a rotating basis? Yes, sir. So it's a, it's a combination. So yes, we are required to audit high-risk type A programs every year. Now, not all type A programs are gonna be high risk. So there's high risk and there's low risk, or actually the terminology is there's low risk and then there's not low risk. But uh, so we have to be on a three year cycle. So typically every third year we would, we would audit a type A program. Um, this year with all the COVID money, when that money was distributed by the federal agencies, they identified those funds as being high risk. So those were automatically not low risk type A's, which required an audit. So that's why you may see an uptick in the number of programs that we audited this year. And it's because those COVID funds were identified as higher risk by those agencies. 
what causes a particular category of funds to be categorized as having a higher risk versus lower risk? Uh, so for these fundings, they were identified by the actual agency themselves. So they, they identified those as high risk. Uh, that's not a determination we make uh, as part of a, as, a, as an auditor. Um, it was a similar situation probably, I don't know, when was ARA? About <coughs> 10 years ago. To ARA the, the, was American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. About, to, about a decade ago, they also, the agencies identified those specific fundings as high risk. Do you check to make certain that when we receive money that it's being spent for the purpose for which we have received the money? Yes, sir, absolutely. So uh, when, we're, when we're doing performing these audits, um, we have to identify the direct and material compliance requirements for these uh, programs. Um, and one of those that we identify as direct and material is allowable cost and allowable activities. So through our sampling that we perform under to meet that to test that compliance requirement, we do test to ensure that those monies are being used for the purposes of those grants. You use the terminology uh, samples. Does that mean that you take a look at our internal controls? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so we obtain an understanding of the internal controls over compliance, and then we take that understanding. So if we don't identify any discrepancies or deficiencies in internal controls, that helps us go, okay, well, you know, we have to use this rating for our sampling, whereas if we had some issues or concerns with internal controls, we'd want to expand our sample. So did you identify any weaknesses in our internal control structure? No, sir. We did not identify any, any deficiencies in internal controls over financial reporting or over the federal uh, single audit. Uh, did you prepare a management letter, and, and if so, did you identify any deficiencies that you wanted to bring to the attention of the board? So we did, uh, we did prepare a management representation letter. We had Karen and some of our other officials sign the representation letter. Uh, we did not have any deficiencies uh, in that letter. Included in the single audit report in the back, I believe you have a separate letter and this is a uh, known as a governance letter, governance communication letter. So as part of our audit standards, we're required to make certain communications to governance. That, those are included in this letter. I can give you the cliff, the cliff notes real quick. Uh, we remained independent throughout the audit. We did not have any disagreements with management. We did not have any findings. Uh, we did not have any uncorrected misstatements. Um, as Karen mentioned earlier, there was a change in uh, accounting policy for the implementation of GASB 84, and I believe that uh, we've identified the significant estimates that Karen mentioned earlier about foundation um, and allowance for uh, taxes, and I believe that that covers it. Oh, and management also did not uh, seek a second opinion on any of the conclusions that were reached during the audit. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, and this is a, almost like a jump ball uh, between you and Karen. We have a unrestricted net position deficit, and that's a really big number. Uh, how was that number created uh, to be of that size, and what impact does that have on our rating agency from the rating agencies when we, when we go to the bond market? Mr. Jackson, I'll take that question. Uh, the reason why that number is so, such a large <laughs> negative has to do with the uh, OPEB and the pension liability, the, the new Gasby's a couple years ago, and how we had to record and bring in that total liability. And almost every school district is in this situation. And uh, just as a rem uh, reminder, one of the things that's done whenever they look, well, one of the items they remove from the first criteria because of this, and then they also, in certain calculations, will remove this from the calculation because they know it would cause you to fail it. But uh, this particular item reflects the fact that is if we paid, uh, it, it, we had, it, 
the amount that's on the books we were responsible for at that point in time, the total liability of which that would not be the case. What you really want to look at is the contributions that the district makes and is required to make, and did they make meet their annual requirements? And that's what's reflected in the governmental fund financial statements of which we made all our contributions and met all those requirements. And since you mentioned that we make contributions, uh, approximately how much did we make in the way of pension contributions? If you will uh, go look, there's actually, it's actually a combination of numbers, but if I believe what you probably are referring to is uh, what is on, let's see, I think it's on page 62 around that page number, and our, contrib uh, our contributions, let's see, trying to find it were uh, the member well the district contribution was 27.8 million and the member contributions were 64 million and then the state contributions were 45 million so basically what you're telling me is what created that very large deficit is the accounting rules changed and required us to put our pro rata share of all future pension liabilities immediately on the books, and we never had to do that before. That is correct. Uh, and that, that rule was effective for all districts, correct? Yes, that was effective for all districts. And probably all other governmental agencies mm -hmm. that had pensions as well. Yes. Excellent, thank you. You know, something that uh, is always something that as a board we need to be aware of is significant estimates or accruals. And the reason why I bring that, that up is those are never 100% accurate. So whatever you come up with will not be accurate because it's uh, an estimate or for lack of a better word, a guess, but we, we hope it's closer to an estimate than it is to a guess. Uh, so what were our major estimates or accruals? Uh, the major um, estimates that we have, like if you look at the government-wide financial statements, it's going to be the pension liability, our OPEB liability, and accrued interest. If you look at the governmental uh, fund financial statements, the main one for revenue is our state aid uh, accrual, and that one was a little more complicated this year because of taking into account the hold harmless. And then also on the expenditure side, the main ones are our uh, salary accrual that we have to do, and then also uh, our construction, accruing in any of our construction that we would need to pay or bring in that liability. You mentioned that you have to uh, actually forecast uh, state aid, but isn't it as simple as you have X number of students times it, why dollars and that becomes your number or is it more complicated than that? Um, the, Mr. Jackson, the way it's based is um, the summary of finance, like with the way we're funded every single year and get our funding is based on some enrollment projections that we provide to the state several, sometimes several years before. It's actually due uh, in October before a legislative session starts and you give them the projections for the biennium the best you know at that point in time and then that's how they pay you state aid throughout the year then at the very at the end of the year they take your PEMS data that you have submitted that shows your average daily attendance and what has happened with your special population such as special education career and technology etc and we we look at what we earned and then so then you have to take that and you compare what you earned to what you were paid and you were either either over or underpaid. This year, uh, many districts were overpaid because of the enrollment was down compared to what they expected it to be, as well as average daily attendance. And so a nuance that made it even worse for us that I kind of alluded to uh, that it was different this year is the fact that we weren't truly held harmless because they did a three-year average in calculating that hold harmless that included 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20. 
And you may recall 1920 was the first year that House Bill 3 was implemented. So we didn't get the benefit of House Bill 3 in those other two years. So that's why it was maybe a little bit more as far as the hold harmless that we weren't held harmless. But then it also included um, the average daily, I mean the average daily attendance hold harmless that we would have to calculate and basically the state takes back from us. And when they do that, they actually take it from us in the next fiscal year out of our money. And so that our money is reduced the next fiscal year for that dollar amount. And then we transferred the ESSER funds in. So the short answer is, it's not a simple calculation. That's it's correct. a complicated calculation. Yeah. <laughs> it's very complicated. You are correct. Um, you know, that pension number is very, very large on, on the balance sheet, as well as uh, the amount that we pay. Do we develop that number ourselves, or is that done by an outside entity? It's actually um, actuaries. Uh, calculate those numbers for the state, and then the state auditor's office actually audits those numbers. So somebody else has the responsibility of preparing the numbers, yes, sir. auditing the numbers. Our only job is to extract that portion that applies to us. That is correct. In fact, uh, the TRS actually produces a comprehensive annual financial report and provides us the information that sh must go in our notes to the financial statements. I want to compliment you on the uh, MDNA management's discussion and analysis of earnings. I have written those before and I've audited those. Uh, I find it scintillating reading, uh, al although some may, may find that it puts you to sleep. Uh, but it's an excellent way to tell our story, for you to tell the story of the district, but also to highlight important financial aspects. It takes a lot of work to go into that. Uh, and and you, you have to make certain you cover your bases. There are certain guidelines you have to follow, but at the end of the day, it's up to you uh, to tell the story that needs to be told. And, and it was an excellent job, and I just want to say uh, thank you for a job well done, and, and to our auditors, thank you for being here as well. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions from board members? Thank you all very much for the report. And since we are talking numbers, uh, Side Creek and Katie are tied one to one in the uh, district playoff volleyball. Down. We're down now. Now we're down one. My tweets aren't coming in as fast as yours, Vicky. My tweets are not coming in as fast as yours. It's, it's a shame. Well, let's hope the Cougars fight back. And with the board's permission, I'd like to put that on cons that report on consent. Uh, 11B, the board will consider approving the budget amendments for the period of July 1, 2021 through September 30, 2021. Any questions from board members? I'd like that on consent as well. 11C, the board will consider approving on second reading additions, revisions, or deletions to district policies, DEC local compensation and benefits, leaves, and absences. This is a revision. FFAC Local, Wellness and Health Services, Medical Treatment, that's a revision. Any questions from board members on either one of those? Tom. Be Deborah Stewart or Roy Garcia, whichever one wants to answer, I guess, depending on your question. And I guess this would be for, for you, Deborah. We obviously know this answer, but, I, but this is very important what's in here. Uh, for 11 dot c dot one we have a choice to make and there's a recommend the recommendation for management here uh, briefly talk about that what that recommendation is I'm up and Sharita can share those mental health uh, provisions for family medical leave in more detail than I probably can Will you repeat your question? So I want you, I, I would like, like for you to explain the concept of, of 11.c.1. What exactly are we doing here? Uh, there is a choice that is being recommended, and I would just like a little more information for the viewing public on that. 
Oh, okay. Yes, there's a couple of things, as you said, that are that are um, being recommended. One of those recommendations relates to adding leave, mental health leave for employees. Um, it's a, a form of respite leave in the event that there is a, and let me get the exact ver verbiage here. If there is a, um, a traumatic event that has occurred within the workplace, within the district, that there is leave available for that person to be assessed. And so they would not have to access their leave bank and they would have the time to um, identify if they needed to get further mental health care. And are we making this available for one category of employees or for all employees? All employees. And, and that's a very important recommendation. Uh, as we know, COVID has been tremendously impactful, uh, but this profession is always tremendously impacted and has been. And because of our reduced funding from the state, it puts a additional pressure and stress, and I appreciate uh, the recommendation to making this available for all employees. Thank you, Sharita, and thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Any other questions from board members? I'd like to move that to consent. That takes us to 11D. The board will consider approving a resolution pursuant to Education Code 29.9091 to operate a local remote learning program in accordance with with the statutory requirements. <coughs> I believe we have a brief, is the first word that's before presentation, a brief presentation from Dr. Linda Macias. Good evening, Mr. Ryan, board members, Dr. Henry. As you know, we have been providing a temporary virtual learning option for students in grades K through sixth grade whose parents uh, were concerned about sending their children to school for their instruction. This is a student group that did not have a vaccine available to them at the beginning of the school year. The temporary virtual learning, or the TVL as we call it, was in place, was put in place for the first marking period or until a vaccine became available. You may have heard that a vaccine for this age group is now available. When school started, however, ADA funding for students, so funding from the state for, uh, for students learning and the temporary virtual learning was not available, was not being provided by, by the state. The district was actually funding the option. You may recall that there were several virtual bills introduced in the 87th legislature, uh, that regular session, because this session kind of kept going and going and going, but none of them made it to law. Then, however, when the, when the special session was called, Senate Bill 15, a virtual bill, was actually adopted, actually became law. Oh, hold on. I asked for the clicker, and then I'm not clicking. Yes. So Senate Bill 15 actually says that districts may now provide remote or virtual instruction, and that districts may receive funding for students. But there are eligibility requirements in Senate Bill 15 for students to for for us to be able to receive ADA funding for students, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So the remote learning instruction may be synchronous or asynchronous or a combination. And it also restricts districts to having no more than 10% of its student, student enrollment in, in, a, in a virtual platform. So in, in order for us to receive funding through Senate Bill 15, uh, the district must have received a rating of a C or higher in the 18-19 school year. You may recall that during that school year, we actually earned a 92. The district must also offer an on-campus option. So you just can't offer virtual. You have to offer an on-campus option. And we as a district must administer, must administer our locally developed assessments, our, our DPMs, our benchmarks, as well as all state assessments to virtual learners, just like we do for the on-campus uh, students. And if a virtual learner is failing, then they must return back to on-campus instruction. We also must provide teachers with training on virtual learning, which we've also done, and a teacher can 
cannot have virtual learning, virtual learners and on-campus students that merge that we did last year, that is not allowed as part of Senate Bill 15. The bill also states that students who were in, rem in a remote learning setting last year for 50% of the time or more of the school year have to meet these criteria as well. And I will tell you that the majority of our temporary virtual learners were virtual learners last year in the school. I think it's 82, 80, it's in the, in the 80%. So in order to receive funding for these students, um, they must, we must again offer the on-campus instruction uh, as, as, a, as a choice. We again have to be rated uh, a C or better. And these students have to have earned a C or better in their core areas. So they couldn't be failing anything to be eligible for, for, uh, for, for, the, for the virtual learning. Uh, they must have passed STAR and I'm sorry, I'm going back to my other page. Um, so they have to have passed STAR, all STAR, all STAR assessments. So if there were three star assessments, they had to have passed all stars. If they, if they uh, failed one, then they wouldn't be eligible for this. And then attendance is also a component there. They have to have had 10% or fewer uh, absences. And then I talked about earning the C or higher. I can tell you that our current temporary virtual learning, all of our students do not meet this criteria. Okay, this is a criteria that's said by Senate Bill 15. In addition, all students, whether they were in virtual learning last year or not, have to maintain a C or higher in their core areas during this school year and less than 10% unexcused absences. So I'll remind you that our, that our temporary uh, learning option was really more of a health and safety uh, option for, for our students. So then what does that mean? What does that mean for, uh, for temporary virtual learning? Really, plain and simply, it means that for students who meet the criteria in Senate Bill 15, we are eligible to, to uh, uh, have ADA funding for them. And for those that do not meet the criteria, then we do not receive any funding for them. The law, state, the law states that we need to have uh, approval from the board, so that, that's why the resolution is here, uh, to be able to uh, pursue the ADA funding for the virtual students who actually meet the criteria. Yes, it is, it is retroactive, thank you, Teresa. It's retroactive to the, to the first day of instruction. So before I, I, uh, I entertain any questions, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our elementary and middle school principals. There's many of them out here, because they loaned us teachers for temporary virtual learning. We didn't, we didn't hire any, any additional teachers. They, they loaned us teachers. I also wanna, wanna thank our district curriculum <coughs> coaches because they also have been teaching in the, in the temporary virtual learning or they've been subbing there as well. And then I'd like to thank uh, doc, Dr. Heather Bergman. She's been overseeing the sixth grade temporary virtual learning. We've had about 400 or so sixth graders. And then finally, Dr. Tanya Gori, she's actually been serving as our temporary virtual learning elementary principal, overseeing over 3,000 students. So we could not have provided this, this option for, for our community without just the, the, the assistance and the support of all of these people. So I wanna thank them. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Julie? Thank you for that update, Dr. Macias. Um, clearly the district did the right thing that we wanted to provide a learning opportunity for the students, for the families that didn't feel comfortable yet sending their kids in person. Um, and it's good to know that now we will receive some state funding to support that um, effort. Um, I'm a little concerned. I think um, it might be helpful for us to know, and we don't, if you don't have the information now, that's fine, uh, to know uh, what that looks like, how many of our kids don't qualify. Something is better than nothing, right? So we'll take that. Um, and then will that, so that's one question I have, um, and maybe that will help alleviate some of the additional costs that we're experiencing from this program. But also um, with the availability now of a vaccine for that age group, is there a time limit on SB 15? 
I mean, do they say, will they provide that funding through the school year or not? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer, okay. um, so I'll answer both questions. <laughs> so we, the, the state is actually gonna provide a list of all the students who were in virtual learning 50% of the time or more. So they haven't provided that list for us yet, but they're gonna provide that for us. But we have gone and, gone and, and, and looked, looked at the kids and, and, and have an estimate. And so we're estimating somewhere between 52 and 60%, somewhere around there, of, uh, of students that we will be able to receive ADA funding for them. Okay. As far as, as the funding and, and, and how long it lasts, um, the funding is retroactive to the first day of school. We, we, we are, um, right now our goal is, or our plan is, to be able to uh, seize the temporary virtual learning by Christmas break. So, so when kids return in January, they will be back in school. That gives parents time to really even do the second the second vaccination. Uh, and then that gives our, our staff time to prepare uh, during, during the, the, the winter break so that they can receive our students in January. John? Linda, once uh, a student has been vaccinated, uh, are they uh, allowed to stay in if they're if the parent still wants them to go through the LV uh, the TLV uh, program or are we going to ask that they then come in person we will no longer have the temporary virtual learning uh, dr. Ogletree we have we shared with the community from the onset that it was a temporary option mm -hmm. and that it would be for the first marking period or until a vaccine was available and we we need to return our teachers uh, back to the campuses because their numbers are growing as well and so they also need their teachers and then from the curriculum standpoint we have not been able to be out there at campuses supporting teachers or kids because the curriculum coaches are teaching or uh, or substituting. So so we will not have a temporary the the temporary virtual option will no longer be available. Oh, okay. But that that's in January. In January. In, yes, January. That's in January. And and I would uh, just remind uh, this board and of course everyone else Katie had a similar program that they stopped 3 weeks ago, Klein Spring Branch. All of our neighbors never even tried this. So uh, we've we've maintained ours longer than anyone in the area. Any other questions from board members, Tom? You know, just just to make certain the viewing audience understands, because we've we've thrown some words around. Um, we aren't suggesting that parents have to have their child vaccinated, correct? That is correct. That is parental choice. That is correct. Uh, but merely from a management perspective, uh, we will discontinue the temporary virtual learning at the end of the first semester at at, at the end of the of the uh, yes and the, at the end of the first semester for middle for secondaries for middle school but for elementary the second semester doesn't end until mid-january but we will we will not continue virtual learning for all students when they come back in january they will be face to face all students so all students irrespective of the marking period when school starts First day of school in January, everybody's back on campus. Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Any additional questions? I'd like to move that to consent as well. Yes. Just, just so everyone understands the date, that's January 4th uh, when everyone will be back in person. 11E, the board will consider approving the memorandum of understanding between Cypress Fairbanks ISD and William Marsh Rice University regarding the Houston Education Research Consor uh, Consortium. And this are any questions for Dr. Macias or Dr. Claiborne? Okay, Julie, no, go ahead. Um, Dr. Macias, this is a new program Actually, it actually it's not. It's it's been around for several years now. But it's new for us. 
Is no, that right? no we, we've been we, doing, okay. yes, we, we've been involved with them. Uh, one of the things that we that we have been uh, participated with them in the past, which has been very beneficial, was their mobility study. Mm -hmm. And it was actually that mobility study that led to us looking into hiring transition te transition teachers at some of our schools. And what they do is they work with kids that are new to to the district so they're that mobility piece okay. and uh, I think I think mr. Jackson had asked us to look into that at one point and mm -hmm. so this group actually did a did a did research study and were able to share with us what our mobility rate not only was but where the main areas were mm -hmm. and then we placed our transition specialists there to work with kids that have transitioned or are new to the district um. Okay, who is the, do we have representatives on their advisory board and on their, um, I think it's the advisory board and their regional working board? <coughs> do we have, who's our, who's our person that? So our person that, that uh, works with, with her from our district mm -hmm. is Dr. Claiborne. Okay, okay. If I have additional questions, I'll just reach out directly to okay. Dr. Claiborne. Just, I'm just curious as about uh, um, uh, and understanding the benefits to our district for participating in this. It's it's all research based. Mm -hmm. It's all research based, and we have choices where uh, whether we want to participate in the different research areas that okay. they're going to do. So we haven't always participated in them. Okay. That we've said no to some of them. But if they have been areas like the mobility study that they did and comparisons among among the entire uh, greater the Houston area, area sure. we participated in that one. But we okay. have a choice whether we want to participate okay. or not, and we've declined some. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Like to move that to consent. Agenda item 11F: The board will consider approving the shared service arrangement between Cypress Fairbanks ISD and Methodist Health Centers DBA Houston, Methodist Willowbrook. Any questions for Dr. Bergman or Dr. Macias? Like to move that to consent. 11G: The board will consider awarding bids and contracts on our authorizing purchase orders as recommended. In the posted agenda item, 11G1, marketing services, request for proposal. 11G3, Zonar annual service agreement. Any questions for uh, Bill Powell on this? I'd like to move that to consent. 11H, the board will consider approving the renewal affiliation agreement with Lone Star College to fulfill the curriculum requirements in collegiate registered nurse and licensed vocational nurse programs through clinical placements. Any questions for Roy Garcia or Bevan? I'd like to move that to consent. 11-1, the, bo oh, the board will consider a level three discipline appeal of a level two uh, Psy Creek High School decision made by the Discipline Review Committee. This item will be discussed in closed session this evening pursuant to section 551.071 and 551.082. That will take us to 11J. The board will consider a level three discipline appeal of a level two row middle school decision made by the discipline review committee. This item will be discussed in closed session this evening pursuant to section 551.071 and 551.082. The superintendent's briefing of the of the agenda will be presented at the regular board meeting on Monday, November 8th, 2021. The board will now move to closed session under Texas Government Code Open Meetings Act for the purpose stated in the posting of this meeting. If the board determines that any final action, final vote or decision on any matter discussed or considered in the closed session is required, such final vote, action or decision shall be taken upon the reconvening of this meeting in open session or at a subsequent meeting of the board in open session after proper notice has been posted. May I have a motion to move into closed session? So move. I have a motion from Dr. Ogletree and a second uh, for Ms. Heineman. All those in favor, please signify. It is unanimous and it's 718. Thank you, this board work session is adjourned and we will now go into closed session. Thank you everyone for being here, by the way.